wind capacity last year, then we've added coal capacity in the past five years put together. And renewables, other than big hydro, got last year $71 billion of private capital. Nuclear, as usual, got zero. It is only bought by central planners with a draw on the public purse. What does this tell you? I mean, what, what part of the story does anybody who take markets seriously not get? And yet, uh, well, the media clearly in this country doesn't get it because it is raised over and over again by the candidates. I mean, it seems that uh, Senator McCain has a favorite number, 100 years in Iraq, also hoping for 100 more new nuclear power plants. He had said something about he doesn't want to lose the knowledge of building since the last one was built more than 30 years ago. The people are dying who would build it, so we've got to rush and build them now. Well, it, you could say that's already been lost in the sense that most of a new nuclear plant built now in the U.S., if there were any, uh, would have to be imported, which, by the way, means we buy it in weak U.S. dollars, which is part of the incredible cost escalation we've seen. Uh, Moody's latest number is $7,500 a kilowatt. Uh, that's, a, again, as the journal said, about two to four times the numbers that were being bandied about just last year by promoters. And uh, Barack Obama, while he hasn't laid out a plan for building, he's a big uh, campaign contributor, Exelon, and has supported the expansion of nuclear power. And, of course, we heard what President Bush has to say. Actually, I thought what Senator Obama said was explore, which is different. And, and you will find major environmental groups saying something like explore or consider, but they will also say very carefully it has to be competitive, it has to be cost effective, and clearly that doesn't even pass the giggle test. Uh, a new nuclear plant, according to Moody's, would send out electricity for about 15 cents a kilowatt hour, which is half again as much as the average residential rate, um, and that doesn't even count for delivering it to your house. And I think if, if nuclear plants were built, which I don't think is likely, you would see incredible rate shock and a big political reaction. Um, environmentalists like Stuart Brand and uh, James Lovelock uh, are pushing nuclear power. Uh, there are actually four individuals involved in the world who are prominent environmentalists who have that view, and you've named two of them. Who are the other two? Uh, Patrick Moore uh, was active in founding Greenpeace back in the 70s, and now works uh, for industry. Um, and uh, uh, Peter Schwartz, who used to be on my board. Uh, who used to run group planning for World Dutch Shell, uh, is of the same view. But there, I can't think of any others. There are no actual environmental groups who favor nuclear power. Uh, what is your answer to them, and why have they arrived? These are your old colleagues. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, t t uh, a couple of them are old friends. Well, I think they haven't done their homework. And uh, I keep asking for their analysis and not getting it, because I don't think they have one. But uh, they, they somehow form the view that because nuclear doesn't emit carbon, it must be a good thing. Well, that's not good enough. Uh, you need a source that doesn't emit carbon. Uh, nuclear emits a little bit in the fuel cycle and, and in building plants and so on. But anyone that doesn't emit carbon and is faster and cheaper than other ways to do the same thing. You see, renewables don't emit carbon. Efficiency doesn't emit carbon. Cogeneration based on recovered waste heat you were throwing away anyhow doesn't emit carbon because you already paid for the carbon in making the in the making the useful part of the heat in industry. And these sources are a great deal cheaper and faster than nuclear. So if climate's a problem, we need to invest judiciously, not indiscriminately, to get the most solution per dollar, the most solution per year. Otherwise, we're making things worse. We're talking to Amory Lovins. He is co-founder, chair, and chief scientist at Rocky Mountain Institute, which is based in Aspen in um, Colorado. Old snowmass. <laughs> old snowmass. Um, nuclear power is one of the issues that is being posed as an alternative to reliance on foreign fuel. And this is also an issue we addressed yesterday with Naomi Klein on Democracy Now!, the issue of uh, expanding oil drilling offshore and onshore. You've been looking at this. Well, we're, we seem to be wanting to drill in all the wrong places. Uh, for example, over 50 times as much oil as might be under the Arctic refuge at very high prices can be saved at very low prices by using the oil efficiently, uh, <clears throat> also uh, many times faster. So uh, 
My wildcatters have been drilling lately in the Detroit formation. Uh, that is, making efficient cars uh, is equivalent to finding an all-American Saudi Arabia under Detroit, uh, about eight and a half million barrels a day, uh, inexhaustible, climate safe, and uh, costing about 12 bucks a barrel. Now, <clears throat> altogether, there's about 14 million barrels a day of oil savings, averaging 12 bucks a barrel cost. And uh, <clears throat> we know exactly where the oil is. There's no doubt that it's there. It's under Detroit, Seattle, and so on. That's out of you know, 20 or so million barrels a day we're using. So if you're an oil company and you go to the ends of the earth and drill for very expensive oil that might not even be there, wouldn't it be embarrassing if somebody else meanwhile found all that cheap oil under Detroit? Shouldn't we drill the most prospective place first? I've tried this uh, formulation lately on the American Association of Petroleum Geologists and the American Petroleum Institute and they found it pretty persuasive. Uh, you know, I've worked for major oil companies for about 35 years and <clears throat> they understand how expensive it is to drill for oil. Take the Arctic Refuge as an example. Uh, you might think that at today's oil prices it would be clearly a great deal <clears throat> to go drill there. Well, it wasn't before when oil was in the 20 odd dollar a barrel range instead of 140. And that's why the oil companies weren't interested. Guess what? They're still not interested. Why not? <laughs> well, because their costs of drilling have gone up more than the oil price went up. If you talk to people who run exploration in major oil companies, they're still not excited about the Arctic Refuge because practically any other place in the world they could drill would be cheaper and less risky uh, than that extraordinarily remote and hostile environment. So why is Bush pushing it? Who knows? But it, it doesn't make any economic sense. There's no business case for it. And the real showstopper, interestingly, is national security, which you would think that he and Senator McCain and so on would be concerned about. Uh, Jim Woolsey, a not hostile to oil per se, Oklahoman, former, UC, CIA. former CIA director, has actually testified against Arctic refuge drilling on national security grounds. And there's a very simple reason. There's only one way to get the oil south. It's through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which is the most vulnerable part of our energy infrastructure, the biggest terrorist target in our energy infrastructure. It's what he calls Uncle Sam's kick me sign. So think about it, you got an 800 mile pipeline, mostly above ground, mostly accessible by road or by float plane. And if the flow through it is interrupted in the winter for about a week, 900, uh, well, uh, nine, 9 million barrels of hot oil congeals into the world's largest chapstick, a big candle, and then you can't pump it anymore. Could this happen? Well, actually, yes, if, if certain, it, uh, points on the pipeline, pumping stations and so on were attacked or stuff at, at either end. And uh, <clears throat> has that happened? Well, let's see. It's been sabotaged, uh, almost blew itself up uh, on occasion through mismanagement. It's been incompetently bombed twice. It's been shot at 50 times. A drunk shut it down with a, one hole from a rifle bullet. And the scariest thing to me is um, around Y2K, at the turn of the century, a disgruntled engineer was caught by accident about to blow up three critical points with 14 bombs he'd built and tested. We're going to have to leave it there, but we, one answer, have we solved the nuclear waste problem even? No, but I'd, I just come off the wagon on the economics, and then we don't need to argue about whether it's safe. Amory Levins, head of Rocky Mountain Institute, thanks for joining us. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks very much for watching and listening to Democracy Now!